The Old Testament reading can be found in your pew Bibles on page 5, 15, and 16. We'll be reading Psalm chapter 34, verse 4, 8, 17 through 19. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. The poor man called and the Lord heard him. He he saved out of him all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and he delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. The righteous cry out and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. The righteous person may have troubles, but the Lord delivers him from all of them. Amen. New Testament reading, we find it in Romans 8, 35 through 39, and you can find it in your pew Bibles on page 1044. And it reads, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors conquerors through him who love us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height or nor death, that depths, excuse me, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Let's pray quickly. God, thank you so much for this church family. Speak through these words this morning, that they may accomplish your will. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, let me get a little situated. We're going to be looking at a few verses. I may wait for you to find them. I may power on. I might have to find them because I've got them in my old school Bible instead of my new school Bible on my phone. So if I'm reading, I may come back here. But I'm going to start out there because I want us to do a quick little survey. Now, you can raise your hands. It's a very simple instrument. Uh, How many of you feel strong this morning? Go ahead and raise your hands. Okay, good. You can keep them up, okay. All right, how many of you feel fragile this morning? I appreciate your candor. That's something we don't like to uh, let on to. All right, and the last question is, how many of you will not raise your hand no matter what I ask you? Let's see those hands. Okay, thank you. Okay, survey's over. So, fragility has been on my mind a lot recently. I can't help it. I think about um, six women and three men in South Carolina who were murdered by a stranger that they welcome into their Bible study. A killer who spends an hour with them and then later tells people, you know, I almost didn't go through with it because they were so nice to me. I think about my sister-in-law, Don Lyman, who, uh, whose breast cancer has now spread to bones throughout her body mother of three, wife, daughter, church elder, youth teacher. I think about my mom, as I told you, she's recovering from her stroke, and I see her having to work hard to do things that just two weeks ago she was doing without having to think about them. And I also think about how many of you in this circle, in this group, in these pews, have suffered the loss of loved ones in this past year, and if it's been longer than that, in the past two years. 
So all of this makes me aware, sorry to turn my back on you, of how fragile life can be. This graphic on the, uh, on the cover, I'm sure most of you recognize it. Uh, you see it? We put it on some packing, some like shipping boxes or for packing up stuff, getting ready to move. Um, it would be great if crystal or china or fancy ornaments were the only things that needed this label, but they're not. As we've sort of already talked about, the truth is fragility is all around us and sometimes it's even inside us. Whether it's health, whether it's relationships, whether it's our self-confidence, whether it's how things are going at work or how they're not going at work, we have to deal with being fragile. We don't like to admit it. Uh, sometimes we don't want to recognize it. And lots of times we don't want to talk about it with our friends, but it's there. Sooner or later, we're going to have to encounter fragileness in some area of our lives. So that begs the question, what do we do when we're fragile? And it also begs the question, what does God do when we're fragile? As we think about these two questions, maybe we can consider the relationship between our fragileness, our fear, our faith, and our God. So I'll ask the question again. What do you do when you feel fragile? A lot of you uh, strong, candid people raised your hands earlier. There might be some others that didn't feel like raising your hands. If you feel fragile, what do you do? Do you become afraid? That's easy to do. Do you become angry? Do you ask, why me? Or what next? Do you think about what you cannot do? Or do you focus on what God can do? Do you hold on to God and his promises? Do you take refuge in him? We sang about it. Our first song, our opening hymn, talked, talked about that. We sang that. Our scripture, talking about that. Here's another one, Psalm 46, verses 1 through 3. Psalms 46, 1 through 3. You might have heard it. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. Do you call out to God when you're fragile? As we heard our uh, Old Testament reading from Psalm 34, I love Psalm, uh, the 23rd Psalm. A lot of us learn it early and we commit it, but this one has become my favorite Psalm. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. My soul will boast in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. He might as well have said, let the fragile hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those, to look to him, those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called, and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted, close to the brokenhearted, and saves those who are crushed in spirit. A righteous man may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. Wish I had Lee here today, because I know he'd be saying, that's right. 
Did you catch? There's so much in there that I don't want to belabor the point, but you can go home and absorb the goodness, the, the treasure in Psalms 34 for you, and you can pull out one when you need it. One thing that's helpful to me is, one of the things that was near the end of it, the righteous may have many troubles. A righteous man may have many troubles. We may not like that. We might like to think, no, we won't have any troubles. But this is more realistic. This is more functional. We will have troubles. We will struggle with trials. And God may not intervene in the exact way that we want him to. Just talk to Mary and Martha, Lazarus's brother. I'm sure they had very specific ideas of what they wanted God to do and how they wanted him to help them. But God will go with us through those trials, and he will ultimately deliver us from them. Lee. Amen. Okay. <laughs> That's right. All right. I want to look. I was thinking about the challenge in trying to develop this talk was how many things not to talk about. Narrowing it down. Because do you know, from cover to cover, you might think this is a book with, where people have it all figured out. But as the youth class has been learning, as we've been looking through the figures that are talked about in the Faith Hall of Fame chapter of Hebrews 11, it is very much a book of fragile people and fragile circumstances and a strong God. We're going to look at three stories. They're found in Mark, but the Bible is loaded with them. Stories about people in fragile circumstances. The stories I want us to look about are found in Mark, which Pastor Greg has been walking us through. So these, if you've been with us for a couple of weeks as we've been walking through Mark, these stories ought to sound familiar. Or maybe you just know them already. The first one, if you could turn to Mark chapter 4, verse 35. Mark chapter 4, verse 35. That day, when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Okay. Are the disciples fragile at this moment? Yes. What do they do when they're fragile? Freak out. Yes, that's exactly right. These, some of them, not all, but some of them are, I'm believing, seasoned fishermen who work on water. They ought to know when a storm is serious and when it's not. So for them to be worried about their own lives tells you they are in a fragile situation where they are contemplating their own mortality. What do they do? First they freak out, and then what do they do? Okay, okay. They go to Jesus... But in Mark's telling of it, the other Gospels have different language, so maybe the other writers gave them a little bit, took it easy on them. But in Mark's account of this story, they go to Jesus, that's a good thing for all of us to do, but in what spirit do they go to Jesus? Jesus, dude, don't you care? Don't you care that we're in trouble? And I wonder how many times we might slip into that attitude when we're struggling with something. And we might allow ourselves to consider the idea that God doesn't care. How does he let this happen? He must not care. What are you doing? That's pretty much the tone I hear in the disciples' question. Again, if you want to go compare the differences in how one story gets 
covered, go look at the story in the other verses in the other Gospels, and you'll find them asking, save us. Okay. The right thing, go to Jesus. Go to God. Just let's watch our the attitude in which we go to God when we're fragile. What does Jesus do? Remember, those are our two questions. What do we do when we're fragile? What does God, what does Jesus do when they are fragile? What's the first thing Jesus does? He does something amazing. He does something none of us would have been prepared to watch happen. So we can act like we're uh, blasé about what he does, but put yourself in their shoes. Nothing prepared them to understand that this person could do this. The disciples were thinking about what they could not do, which is help themselves. But they had not yet realized and understood what God can do. But they're about to find out. Jesus solves their immediate problem and delivers them from their immediate fragile circumstance in a supernatural way. That's the first thing he does. In this case, God intervenes and delivers them from their immediate danger. The next thing that he does, in doing that, I should say, he shows them that he is more powerful than the situation that makes them fragile. Do you think the disciples understood that when he speaks and this life-threatening storm instantly goes away? Do you think they understood that here was somebody who is more powerful than the situation we were dealing with just 30 seconds ago? Yes, because for the Bible tells me so. Last verse, 41. They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Yes, they do. Who made them? Who made the wind? Who made the waves? Of course they listen to him. That's astounding to us if we haven't considered who's in the back of the boat. But if you understand what he has done, that's not a hard task for him. He shows them he's more powerful than the situation that makes him fragile. And then he turns to his disciples He behaves better than some of us. Let's be honest. If some of us got woken up, we would not behave quite as well as Jesus does. I'm not naming names, but if you got woken up, you would probably not handle yourself as well as Jesus did. He solves the immediate problem, proving he's more powerful than the situation that makes him fragile, and then he wants to know something. Why are you so afraid? Why are you so afraid? Think of that question. You woke me up and you said, don't I care? I hear the fear in your voice. Why are you afraid? If you unpack that a little, he's acknowledging, he's getting them to acknowledge they have not considered him, who he is, what, how much he cares about them, and what he might be able to do about the situation. That's really what I get out of that question. Why are you afraid? Then he says, do you still have no faith? Older translations say, I think this is where he drops one of those old King James English era, oh, ye of little faith. You woke me up for this? He's tired. He's been drained by dealing with a lot of people who need his ministry, and he needs to crash, and they wake him up for this. And he wants to know, why are you afraid? What he is extracting from them is an understanding of the relationship. And I want us to think about it today. The relationship between fear and faith. It's natural to be afraid if you think you are going to drown in a storm. But if you believe that God has an ultimate plan for you, it doesn't seem like you can hold on to both things in equal strength. Does that make sense? You either hold on to a strong faith and a trust that God will somehow make this okay, or you hold on to your fear. It's when we don't understand what God can do that our fear can grow. It's when we gain a picture of what he is willing to do for us, when we are fragile, that our confidence in his power grows and our fear should decrease. Think about that, this relationship between fear and faith. 
Now, jump ahead to Mark 5, starting in verses 21. It also involves a boat. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of a lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue rulers named Jairus came there. Seeing Jesus, he fell at his feet and pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. Okay. What does Jairus do? If you are a parent in this uh, room, you understand. I don't even have to ask the question. It would be rhetorical. Jairus is fragile because his daughter is terminal. What does is, what is Jairus do when he's fragile? He seeks, he goes to Jesus. Same thing the disciples did, but it sounds like it's in a little bit different way. He goes to Jesus, and I'm sorry to insult your intelligence, but why would you do that if you're Jairus? If you're Jairus, why do you seek Jesus out? Yes, you have to think Jesus has the power to do something about it. He says as much, doesn't he? My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. Isn't it fascinating? Maybe it's not to you. It is to me. He's going to Jesus when he's fragile. He has a a glimpse of what Jesus might be able to do. That's different than how the disciples treat their fragile moment. What what does Jesus do when Jairus is fragile? He goes with him. I hope that hits you. He does not leave him. He goes with him. But... Our third story interrupts our second story. Pick it up at verse 24. A large crowd followed and pressed around him, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet, instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because, she thought, If I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? That's not like some of us who have spent a while putting ourselves together, and somebody might have spilled something on them, or they're wrinkled, or that, that. He's not asking for that reason. This is a, another supernatural event in which power is conducted. Power to heal moves from Jesus through clothes to a woman who believes that can help her. Why does she, if the woman, you know the woman is fragile, put yourself in her place. If you have tried to seek the best help you can find, and instead of getting better, you're getting worse, and you've gone through all of your resources, this is about as fragile as I can imagine if your daughter isn't dying. She goes to Jesus when she is fragile. She goes to Jesus because she has a hope that he can do something about it. We might say that's an odd way for healing to happen. That doesn't, what we think about how that happened doesn't really matter to that woman. She thought Jesus could do something about it. What does Jesus do? At first you might think, well, not anything. He's walking. He's walking with Jairus. But when he is aware that healing has, that power has gone out from him, he stops. He asks the question, who touched my clothes? And the disciples have that natural response. What are you talking about? Could have been a hundred people. One of the many opportunities we see where Jesus is on one level and the his well-meaning disciples are on another. They're on like a like the old C B radios. They are on another channel and they gotta dial it up to his. 
Lots of people around you, and that's not what he's asking. When he asks, he wants to connect with this person. He does not want it to be an impersonal vending machine dispensed through a hem of a garment. He wants to know. He wants to connect. And listen to what he says. Oh, yes, and he wants her to realize, although I think she has a pretty good idea, that he is more powerful than the medical condition that has made her fragile. He says, daughter, your faith has healed you. How about that? How about that? Your faith has healed you. Daughter, your faith has healed you. He's on the way to try to help someone else's daughter. This happens, and he wants to look her in the eyes and say, daughter, your faith has healed you. You see the whole people crowding around you, his disciples answered. And yet you can ask who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and trembling with fear, fear, trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. That's what elicits his great comment. Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Does it sound like... Jesus wants her to hold faith and fear in equal proportions. No, go in peace. Don't be afraid. Your faith has healed you. Her willingness to believe that God was more powerful than the situations that made her fragile, he's pretty much saying have had a role in helping her to overcome. But what about Jairus? That's great for her. What about Jairus? Pick it up in 36 or 35. While he, Jesus was still speaking, some men came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Okay, so Jairus has now gone from fragile to completely broken. What's going through his mind? We don't know. We weren't there. But i got to believe that he might be considering if he didn't have to stop and help this other person, maybe he would have gotten there sooner and that could have made the difference. I don't know. Is he wondering whose life is more valuable? I don't know what's going through his mind. Picking it up in 36. Ignoring what they said, they being the people that said, she's dead, don't bother him anymore. Ignoring what they said, Jesus told the synagogue ruler... Don't be afraid. Just believe. Fear versus faith. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John. When they came into the house of the synagogue ruler, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. It would be nice to think that all of those people were there because they, were, because they wanted to be. It's possible that they were hired. Some of them might have been hired there in a sort of grieving thing. So that could have explained the commotion. When he sees that, sees all the commotion, and he says, what, what are you doing? What is all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. And they laughed at him. And as Greg pointed out a couple of weeks ago, this is quite an interesting transition. Mark, who doesn't waste many words, goes from they laughed at him to after he put them all out. <laughs> he, does, he has no need for the people who are mocking him. Dead, sleeping, she's dead. Get out. After he had put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him. Why do you think he wants the disciples there? He doesn't take them all in. Fair witness. The boat was one thing. This is something else. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was and said, he took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and walked around. She was 12 years old. At this they were completely astonished. You would be too if you hadn't heard this story a few times. What does Jesus do when Jairus is beyond fragile but broken? He tells him, don't be afraid, just believe. He shows Jairus that he is more powerful than the circumstances that have made Jairus broken. He unbreaks him. 
And really, he's doing exactly what Psalms 147, verse 3 says. Psalms 147, verse 3 He, meaning the Lord, heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. In this moment, he's fulfilling the prophetic messianic words found in Isaiah 61, 1 through 3. If you want to turn to those, Isaiah 61, verses 1 to 3. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair." If you have any doubt about whether this had application to Jesus, go read in Luke where he goes to temple one day. He's asked to read from the scrolls. He knows exactly where he goes. He goes to this chapter in Isaiah and he says, today this has been fulfilled in your ears. Isaiah 41.10. I hope these can be uh, bolstering for us. Isaiah 41.10 says, So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And Isaiah 40, verses 28 through 31 adds, Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is an everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, but, and young men stumble and fall, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. So where's our label? Do you have your bulletin? Do I have my bulletin? Here it is. Find your label. Everything you know about the sermon is in this label. This graphic. When we are weary, God gives us strength. When we are weak, God gives us power. I love this arrow. When you're feeling broken, up, 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 up. Sermon. Now, right now you're saying, then why have you taken so long to just, just pass out this bulletin? This is your sermon right here. <laughs> when we are weak, God gives us power. When we put our hope in the Lord, we can handle the fragileness of life with the strength that God gives us. How else can you explain that family members of one of the people who were murdered in South Carolina made a point of saying to the killer, and we could all hear it because it was televised, we forgive you. We forgive you. In that moment, they had the strength to say, we forgive you. Okay, I just said, I think I, I know I said almost that everything you need to know in the sermon is right here. I should have said almost everything. Because we don't just receive strength from God. We do. We've heard it. We've read it. Many of you have lived it. We also receive strength from one another. So many of you have told me that you're praying for mom, that you're thinking about her, that if there's anything that she or Nat, dad need, Please ask. You want to do it. And I want you to hear that that strengthens me. It strengthens dad. It strengthens mom. Your kindness and caring is strong. And I found a verse that I probably would have never, I would not have thought about this in this way. And then probably God gave me the idea, so I got to give him credit. In Ecclesiastes 4.12, it says, a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. 
in this week, I think I have an idea what those three strands are. One is you, one is me, one is God. As a way to depict this, we have a braided rope. I like to think there are three strands. I'm going with that. But this is what I found at Lowe's. So if there are more than three things, you'll just have to go with three things. A cord of three uh, <laughs> strands is not easily broken. When we hold on to God and when we hold on to one another, we are strong. When we are intertwined, we can't be broken, no matter how fragile life seems. To help you remember that, as you walk out today, we have little short little links of what I'm going with is three-stranded ropes to be a visual reminder of this truth. And you can pull it out whenever you're feeling a little fragile and think about the three strands that keep us strong. Those will be in, at the end of the service, they'll be in offering plates. And when we're done, you can go by and pick them up and get your strand that reminds us about our interconnectedness to not only God who strengthened us, but one another. That, this right here, this was my sister-in-law Don's idea. I told her the Ecclesiastes verse and how it, what it meant to me and what the three facets were. And she says, you know what you could do? You could go to Lowe's. You can find a rope. You can cut it into little links and give it to people so they remember it. That's her idea. And I want you to know that she called us this week and said she is feeling her pain is down, her appetite is up, her energy is up. She is feeling better than she has in a while. And we are praising God for that. She is being strengthened in a fragile uh, circumstance. I want to get to what Paul asks in Romans 8. It was read wonderfully before, because I think it's important for us to hear it. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Romans 8, 35. Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword or stroke or stage four cancer, or murder. Put your own fragile circumstance in that list. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future Listen to this. Nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. For God so loved you that he gave his son, the only one, that whoever of us believe in him will not perish but have everlasting life. That is ultimate delivery out of our immediate fragileness. That is God's love spanning any chasm more powerful than any circumstances that make us fragile. In fact, it is the fragile who really understand the full meaning of the words, and I'm so glad we sang it earlier, that the kid story helped us sing. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones, that's all of us, to him belong. We are weak, but he is strong. When we are feeling fragile, we can hold on to God and one another, or we can let go of the rope. But I believe that when we are feeling the weakest, that's when our grip on God and on one another needs to be the strongest. My mom's left side is stronger right now than her right side. When I go in to see her, she'll reach out her left hand and she'll grab my hand and, we'll, and she'll hold on to it and her grip is strong. My mom went to the hospital during the week of VBS and each night at VBS, we'd play the theme song, which is My God is Powerful, and we'd play it twice. 
the song and its lyrics that include, I will hold on to him, have become especially meaningful to me. And I think it's the perfect anthem for anyone who feels a little fragile this morning. So I'm going to invite the Snowflakes up. That's our band name from VBS. And they are going to help you sing this song because somewhere in there, I believe, is a message that you can take to heart and that can be powerful for you. It has been for me. So Snowflakes, come on up. And if we have any VBS, yes, we need to be, we need, us older kids need to be taught the motions as well. So if you know My God is Powerful, we're going to play it together as our closing song, which is not just for us, it's for all of us. You will be able to get the words as we go through it. But we're going to play this as our closing song.